Okay, we're back here live in uh, Silicon Valley. This is Silicon Angle and Wikibon's The Cube, our flagship program, where we go out to the events and extract a signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined by my co-host, Dave Vellante, the co-founder of Wikibon.org, and uh, this is The Cube. We love to go talk to anyone who has information and data and share that with you, uh, extracting the signal from the noise, as we say. And um, our next guest here is Thomas Summers, CEO and founder of Rex Computing, 17-year-old whiz kid, fellowship from Peter Thiel's uh, uh, fellowship program where he encourages kids to pursue their passion, take a break or drop out of school. Uh, congratulations, welcome to theCUBE. Well, thank you. So you're, the, you're a whiz kid. You know, I, we were just at the Apple 30th um, anniversary. Wozniak wasn't there, but we know Woz from uh, Fusion I.O. We've interviewed him and we've known him in the Valley. You're the next Woz. You're out there uh, building out the next stuff. Uh, tell us a little bit about, one, what the story is around the fellowship Okay, the award, when did it happen, and what, what are you building? Um, yeah, so I received the Teal Fellowship in uh, May of this year, um, or not this year, of 2013, and uh, basically how it works is there's a whole application process and finally uh, rounds down to the 20 under 20, and so uh, it's called the 20 under 20 Teal Fellowship where you receive uh, $100,000 over two years with the only requirement being is that you can't be enrolled in school. Um, so I applied, uh, this is actually my third time applying, and uh, I put in uh, working in high performance computing and specifically tried to reduce the cost and the energy needs uh, by computing by order many orders of magnitude. Um, and so I received the fellowship and started a company. All Third right, so. A charm. <laughs> I guess so. So any VC funding yet? I mean, so we're in a bubble. I mean, any funding yet from uh, besides Peter Thiel? Um, no, so thankfully the, I actually dropped out of my 11th grade of <laughs> high school, so um, I didn't have any debt and uh, I've been able to bootstrap. So what, um, you dropped out of your junior year or you finished through junior year? Uh, so I dropped out one month before the end of my junior year. Okay, so, you, so technically you've got two years under your belt of high school. Uh, yes. In Were you really bored in class? Um, kind you know, of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I asked him what he got on his SATs. He said, I didn't take him. But, <laughs> but Dave, this brings up a big trend. Before we get into, the, we talk about the, the kid, we call him the, the next Waz, because uh, there's a lot of, lot of hardware geeking going on there. Dave, this is exactly kind of what we, we talk about the cube, you know. Information, the, the, the commoditization of, of, of journalism and publishing, and information flow is the, new, is the new normal. And you don't need to go to linear school anymore. You can just, you go online, multi-online uh, MOOCs or multi-online classrooms, information is out there. People can move at such different paces. This is why I'm so passionate about Silicon Academy, the things we're doing that's going to be coming out this next year. And, and you know, props to Peter Thiel. Because you know, some people are against this, like, hey, you know, why disrupt the status quo? But hey, linear path in school uh, is not. So, I mean, how did you, did you have any reservations? Or you're like, thank God I'm out of high school. I mean, what was your what was your thought process? Um, it was pretty crazy at first. Um, I found out I received the fellowship. It was kind of a surreal experience for the first couple of days. Um, after week after I found out that I received it, I officially withdrew from uh, high school. Um, and it was kind of just weird, okay, this is just a whole new step into my life. Um, I, I had already been working uh, pre prior to receiving the fellowship. I worked at MIT for uh, just over three years at the point. And uh, I kind of, you know, had you some knew. life You knew, you had a gut feeling, your, 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 your compass was telling you, and you applied three times. So take us through the first two rejections. <laughs> like, were you like pumped to apply? Were you not sure? Was the rejections hard on you? And then obviously you kept, kept coming back at it, third time's a charm. Uh, take us through that. Yeah, so um, the first year I applied, I was 14. Um, I, you know, was kind of, I, I've always just been a, you know, a geek and uh, working in many different areas. And so uh, I wasn't really focused in my application and um, I was also pretty young. Like I, I definitely wouldn't have chosen me at. Uh, yeah, what, what inspired? Let me ask you that question. What, what was the inspiration to have the passion to do the kind of geekiness and that you're doing? Certainly with hardware, it's, you don't you don't randomly see that. It's kind of like a black swan scenario where you know you get someone at that level. So did you have a relative in the computer business? Do you have your own workshop? How did you get into? It? What was the what was the motivator? What was the what was the inspiration? So. My mom was self-employed. She had a desktop publishing business. Um, she did layout and stuff for different newspapers. 
And uh, so she had computers in her office, and I got to use them from when I was like two until uh, I started first grade when I was about six. And uh, I just really loved them. And uh, when I got about seven, my dad got me my first uh, electronics kit. It was, uh, you know, one of those things from the 70s that it has a bunch of wires and springs and a little light bulb, and you can do a bunch of different uh, electronics like kits and stuff. And I just thought that it was really amazing that you could take, like, take a bunch of components which don't really do anything on their own and you can make something entirely new. And at that point I was just, you know, going through a book and doing all the different projects I could, uh, you know, that were in there. But uh, it started making me think of, okay, but what if I apply these different things and start putting things together in a different way? And I just found so that when you, when you won the award, did your mom freak? Because you, I mean, you're still relatively young, moving to California, right, from Massachusetts. Yeah. So how how'd that go? Was it were they supportive or you know supportive, reluctantly supportive, or how'd you deal with that? Um, so my mom has always been supportive of me through my life. Um, the first time I applied, she thought I was cr kind of crazy for applying, um, but she, you know. You know, do what you want. Um, but when I finally got into the finalist round for the, the fellowship, it kind of, okay, there's, you know, about a 50-50 chance that I'll actually receive it. And she uh, thankfully believed in me and um, thought that, you know, if I actually set my mind to doing something, that I could do it. So the product that you've conceived, it, it's, uh, I mean, big trends, right? Obviously, low power, you got multi-cores going on, and you're, you're, you're observing these trends. So... How did it all come together? And you've got a prop here. What are you actually building? Um, so I originally started this sort of line of research at uh, the lab I was working at at MIT, um, the Institute for Soldier Nanotechnologies. And so my um, mentor advisor there that kind of wrote me into all this um, had a long history of working in um, high performance computing. And so uh, we got interested in some ARM stuff, so he's utilizing cell phone processors to uh, do high performance computing and uh, just specifically clustering them to be able to do more uh, computational work with them. And so uh, this was about 2010, and uh, we bought a bunch of uh, TI OMAP development boards. So it was the first uh, dual core ARM processor, you know, commercially available. Um, and we decided to get a bunch of them and uh, start seeing what we could do. And so took uh, going with a bunch of different designs and such. Uh, about nine months later, we got uh, you know a full system, and we built a, a supercomputer in a Rubbermaid trash can. Um, and that was, at that point, we had actually built you know a, what you could almost call a supercomputer out of you know these cell phone processors. We had 48 of them, total 96 cores. Um, and we thought, okay, this is pretty cool. Uh, we posted online, it got a bit of attention. Um, and we I started to think about, uh, okay, we, we did this just as a fun project. Um, and then we also wrote a paper on the research end. Uh, but then thought, okay, could this be possibly turned into a company or something along those lines? Okay, so um, it's a challenging area. Um you know, we, we were at the original HP Moonshot announcement, right, right outside of Bill and Dave's offices in, uh, in Palo Alto. That was pretty cool. Um, Calzada, the comp one of the companies that was at that announcement, is now defunct. Um, what is, and John's mentioned the WAS a couple times, and it's actually quite interesting, John. I mean, you know, the early floppy disk, right, the system on a board. Um, you know, we look back now, you know, before you were born. <laughs> doesn't look like a big deal, but at the time it was really breakthrough. What is it that you're doing that you see as, as breakthrough? So in the evolution of how this just started as a fun research project to being a company, um, we were originally just you know, fascinated with ARM processors, what you could do with a bunch of really wimpy cores. Um, and that's now evolved to what we're doing today, which is utilizing coprocessors um, to kind of get the performance um, boost against you know a conventional uh, say Intel uh, processor when doing high performance computing tasks. So um, what I have here is uh, a development board uh, called Parallela by a company called Adaptiva, and uh, so this has a dual core 
um, ARM Cortex A9 processor with an integrated FPGA, but the really fancy part about it is this 16-core uh, coprocessor, which can get about 30 gigaflops while using like two watts of electricity. So that's beating an in Intel um, CPU and performance per watt. It's you know, obviously not getting to its actual raw performance, but when you put 10 of these together, you're beating an Intel chip while it costs less and um, you know, out, starts out performing. So obviously the key to massive scale adoption is applications. I mean, you yep. certainly see it in, in mobile. Do you see, I mean, obviously you see it, how long do you feel like this will take to really essentially take over the data center? It's, it's, from a concept standpoint, it makes total sense. Everybody's yep. complaining about you know, heat density and space and power and cooling. So it, it makes so much sense. What, what are the headwinds, obviously application support, and how long do you think it'll take for this to take the data center by storm? Yeah, so the, uh, what we came here to the Open Compute Summit with was a uh, prototype we threw together in about three weeks. Um, and it's a uh, Open Compute Winterfell um, torpedo chassis. And uh, we filled it up with these boards and uh, are using it as basically a development platform because we want to kind of test the software waters. And uh, we're, we, there's the Open Compute Hackathon happening here right now. And we're giving uh, the different Hackathon per participants access to both these boards and the systems in our uh, rack. And the, the, the idea, I mean, the big problem, both when it comes to ARM and any sort of coprocessor, is that it is difficult to develop for it. People, companies don't want to port their software and they don't want to, um, you know, just deal with that mess. And so, I'm personally a hardware person, but uh, thankfully, um, other m members of my team uh, are much more uh, capable on the software side. And we're working on some new ways to both ease development on highly scalable systems and utilizing coprocessors. So that's part of the project, is actually a development platform on which people can, can build applications. Yeah, so the system we're showing here has 256 of these Epiphany cores. And uh, we have that running and as a MPI cluster. And we're you know, trying to get other people interested in developing with it. Um, but our actual product plans are to utilize uh, the next generation Epiphany chip with each chip has 64 cores, the Epiphany 4. Um, and having 64 of those chips in a single um, one-third width, one U um, torpedo. So you can have 1,024 cores inside that or 3,072 cores in a one U uh, open compute. Blade. Thomas, is this a certainty in your mind that this type of architecture eventually will you know, rule the world? Um, or do you feel like, I mean, whether it's ARM or you know, Intel has Atom, whatever, some type of low power processor, obviously ARM has the big lead. Or do you feel like existing designs, x86 let's say, can be you know, brought down to scale? What's your thought on that? So to first address the x86 point, um, x86 just has a lot of baggage with it. Um, I mean, it was originally CISC, um, and then obviously micro, uh, Intel brought in the whole microcode concept, and they have actually have a risk core, which a lot of people don't realize that x86 is risk, and they've basically just abstracted all of it, so they have the same x86 instructions, and then a decoder which actually has it in its native. And so you hit some limits with this. I mean, for you know the past 40 years, or 50 years uh, almost, um, we've had Moore's Law with us, and so we get that basically free uh, performance or energy boost, depending on the way you look at it, every 18 months or so. Um, but with that starting to run out, I mean, we're going to be hitting some physical barriers pretty soon, um, which you can't really contest with you know, using silicon. Um, we're not going to have those free improvements. And so x86, how it is, having backwards compatibility all the way to 386, and it, Intel's focus on just trying to cram as much features and to add, throw in as many instructions as possible is just a bulky um, instruction set and processor that just isn't needed. And um, that's why I think that uh, Tom, the most simple thing is Thomas, talk about um, your plans now. So how far in are you in the fellowship? And the question is, what do you do when the money runs out? Um, is there a follow-on? Do they give more? Is there milestones? So the fellowship money is given out over two years, and so we receive $4,100 or so a month. Um, and crazily enough, I've somehow been able to live on that uh, while no, starting a company in, in the Bay Area. It's kind yeah. of uh, 
But it's going to dry up at some point, so it's a two-year run. Yep. Right. So it's like a, it's almost like a really kick-ass internship <laughs> with cash, co-op assignment, like I, like I had when I was in college. But uh, um, what are you going to do next? Is 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 there a program extension? Have you been communicated? Do they communicate like, hey, if you do well, yeah, or hey, you're on your own, make it or break it? Um, so like the another program the Teal Foundation offers or has that uh, is not directly connected to the fellowship in any way, but or besides it being run by the same uh, group, is uh, Breakout Labs, which uh, a number of Teal fellows have you know talked with at least. Gone into yeah. Are, um, and so there there's things like that, but um, I still have. About a year and a half. Yeah, you got a lot, plenty left. of time. I was just curious. People oh, might yeah, be yeah. curious um, about what the headroom's going to look like, the ladder, if you will. I, I have been bootstrapping up to this point, yeah. but would at some point like to raise um, some money just to be able to scale out. Um, and so, how about a team? Have you talked about like a team, like recruiting a team? Have you looked at trying to find so we more teammates? A, so we currently have a, a, a full-time team of three. Um, and then we have a couple different contributors and uh, people kind of working part time, um, and so. But it's a for-profit venture. Yes. This is not like science project. No. So tell um, us about the the, the, uh, the server. Let me see. Yeah. What's this called? So that's uh, two parallel boards, and okay. so um, the the unit that we we have is uh, having 16 of those. But uh, the the really cool part about it, um, if you forget about the. Xilinx uh, dual core ARM is the fact that it has that 16 core coprocessor, which is currently uh, one of the most uh, power efficient processors on the market. And what's the plans for it? So this first system that we are, um, hope to be shipping uh, this year is going to have uh, four th or, uh, 1,024 with the Epiphany 3. So 1,024 um, Epiphany cores. And then um, with the Epiphany 4, having 4,096 cores in a single um, torpedo. Is being an entrepreneur what you thought it would be? Or um, not? And what's different? It, yeah, it is different. Um, I well, what did you expect when in the mind of like looking at what you might be embarking on? And then what's the reality? Share the folks that pre-conditioning view and then what happened inside now that you're an entrepreneur. Um, I th thought that there would be uh, a lot more um, I, it, it Parties? Was, yeah, I mean, the social, wow. ne the, the, the social network has kind of given a bad name to the Valley in that respect. Um, bong hits and uh, funnels and beer bongs. Uh, and no, none of that, huh? <laughs> Just sitting, we're making the circuit boards. It's an ugly basically, business. Basically, and I'm, I'm honestly happy with that. Um, and we call it eating glass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we, we call <laughs> entrepreneurs, they eat glass, they spit, eat nails, spit out nails, eat glass, spit out nails, I forget how, what we call it, but you know, it's not, a, so you're saying it's not glamorous as people think it is. Not at all, um, but I would say just as, or I think even more fulfilling, being here, uh, I was at the Denver Supercomputing Conference um, back in November, and uh, just being able to go to these events and uh, actually feel like I'm contributing something to society by building something and you know, creating value of some sort um, is a lot more than I would be doing if I was still in high school or if I would go on to college. So now, now we turn college. the interview on to John and Dave's personal focus group test. Since you're the young gun coming up, 17, um, obviously connected to a computer since you were two, so it's great. Now, but now, the digital natives are all connected. I have kids as well, uh, one's, one's 17, one's 18, same year age. And what do you think about this discussion around education? I mean, you know, there are many people, including myself, who think education is completely broken um, and think there are just better ways than, say, government, uh, the way they're, they're handling it. But you're a great example of someone who's in that linear track, and now the virtual space, the internet, the connections are resources. So what's your vision, and what is your opinion around education? I'm not going to hold it to you, so just it's your opinion, mm -hmm. so there's no wrong answer. Yeah, uh, what's your um, opinion on the, on the future of, of how the best path possible for education? I think one thing that is not developed in school, um, especially at the early ages where it's really needed, is to find one, how to learn. Like actually, and that how to learn, I think is, everyone's born with it. Um, it's just not nur uh, nurtured and that is curiosity. and. The ability it, to learn, love to learn? Lo and love to learn. And so I, I see that a lot of schools try to, you know, creativity is good, but they really try to structure it in some way, either through drawing or 
having an art class but not offering other programs and trying to fit everyone into some sort of mold. And I just think that that's the wrong way to go about it. And while that may have been, you know, required to a small extent by society 150 to 100 years ago when Industrial Revolution, there weren't the, the society was actually trying to mold people into going into industrial jobs and such. Um, that is, I think, detrimental to society now. And we're not adapting the education what, system. What do you think about these Gen 1 MOOCs, M-O-O-C, multi-online yeah. courses, uh, massive online online courses, um, essentially like, like, like video games, basically. Uh, are they too linear? Are they not enough data? Is the application tooling not there? Or is it good? What's your opinion? Have you, have you kicked the tires on any of that stuff? I mean, I'm sure you use, I'll do a lot of learning online because you're a curious, smart kid, but I mean, you tap the resources available to you. What needs to get done? What are these MOOCs? What is this all about? What's this new online situation like? Um, yeah, I haven't uh, actually been involved with any of them. I haven't taken like an organized class, um, but from my knowledge of it, um, I think that it's a good idea for people who already are motivated and people who want and to truly learn. And I think that sadly, uh, many people who have the opportunity and the abilities to do many different things are discouraged at a young age and thus lose the love of uh, knowledge. Let me learning. ask you a different question. Where do you go to learn? Um, I read a lot of papers. I, I enjoy... Um, uh, sadly, I don't have uh, academic, uh, like actual paper uh, access, any research journal access through a school anymore. But um, being just reading whatever the cutting edge research is from different labs from across the world. And you do that online, on, online, right? Yes. Um, and so talk about academic papers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that there, there's a lot of cutting edge research, which like you see a lot of these things in the news all the time. But I find those to be the ones that uh, make the biggest claims that typically are far from truth, and then the ones that are really interesting uh, get published and nobody else sees nobody talks about them. Right. So, <laughs> and then we see them in you know 20 years. But that's a real art to be able to sort of squint through that that text and, and figure out which ones really matter. Yeah. You know, so what are some of, the, some of the things that you're tracking to these I mean, these days? I mean, obviously low power. Uh, multi-core servers caught your attention. Mm -hmm. What else like, intrigued you? Um, ever since I saw Iron Man, I've been very, very interested in augmented reality and wearable computing. Um, I see I, that's now a big thing uh, yeah. now, but uh, I, I think that that isn't going to be successful in this first generation with Google Glass and some of the other uh, things that are going to be on the market. but. I think that there's going to be a lot of potential in some of the uh, new photonics and laser research, which is taking place right now, but um, industry hasn't quite gotten directly involved with it. And so I think that academia is actually ahead right now with it, but it'll be getting into you know, actual production in a number of, a couple years. Okay, Thomas, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Uh, very impressive individual um, and gutsy to, to drop out of high school. Um, Looks like you're well along the way, but you might want to just go, you know, mail in. University of Phoenix might have a high school GED program. It's like an hour of your time, knock it out. Um, I don't even know if that's even an option, I just made that up, but it sounded good. Um, the, 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 the future is what you're doing, and I think that's what's what I find truly interesting. You're a founder of a company, and uh, it's awesome. So thanks for coming on theCUBE. It's theCUBE, we'll be right back. 17-year-old genius here inside theCUBE, Peter Thiel, uh, Thiel Fellow. $100,000 grant uh, to drop out of school, start his own company, um, and we'll see how that goes. We'll be keeping track of it. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>